The expedition is currently under investigation at the Nicaraguan border. Camera work has forced a search on our vehicles and our cameras from rolling. Our documentary has never come closer to being shut down. I can't stress enough how hard it can be to film in these countries sometimes. Years of experience filming all over the world has built a tolerance to the risk, but every now and then, you're reminded how vulnerable you really are. That was close, I think that was close. I hope we don't get any closer to production shutdown than that right there. I definitely felt a strong hesitancy to not record, to not film, and I didn't go with my gut on it, and that was the cause of all of that chaos. And I think everyone like, sat back in the saddle a bit and just showed them the bare minimum of what they needed to see, uh, hiding our most important assets, our hard drives, Cards were like hidden, safe, in secure pockets and pants. Like that kind of thing right there was really awesome to see. They didn't uh, even look at some of our drawers. Yeah, no. they didn't touch them. They didn't see our helicopters. They didn't see. They never had me open up the back of Apollo, which would have totally sunk us. Oh, <laughs> yeah. All like, of our Pelican <laughs> cases were right there. <laughs> if they would have saw Chopper, it would have been bad news bears. I think our team really needed like that border crossing because we kind of came relaxed but the reality is like, this could be in every single one. You know, we could have this guy open up every single time. So we've had some good ones and having this one bad one is like a good wake up call for us. Yeah. We're, we're here to kind of film this and record and document our adventure. So it's all part of the game. They did keep copies of all our uh, passports, even above and beyond the ones they normally keep. A little worried about what the repercussions there are when we get to the next border perhaps, or when uh, coming through another time, who knows, we may get looked at a little harder, but we, we passed the test this time. They were happy with what they saw and uh, we're, we're good and we're on our way and we're now on Nicaraguan soil, just a few miles from the border. So we're gonna get to bed for the night. It's late, starting to get late. It's time to go to get some rest and relaxation. While we sleep through the night, across the world in Morocco, the girls of Expedition Overland are on leg four of the Raleigh des Gazelles. It's a technical nine day, all women's map and compass navigation race across the Sahara. I can vouch that she is not driven in a way that has required the breaking of a king coil. <laughs> Thankfully, the mechanics were able to replace their broken coil, and the usual challenges are back to being tackled. I'll remind you that speed is not the object of the rally. Instead, precise navigation and teamwork between driver and navigator is what puts you on the podium. Rochelle and Rhonda have found a roadblock, a deep ditch dug across the desert while heading toward their fifth checkpoint of the day. See. Okay, we're gonna see if we can make a bridge with our max tracks, see if they're long enough. If it's not, this is gonna really suck. We're gonna have to go way far out of our way. Maybe these girls wanna help us that are behind us. Fellow American racers Jesse Combs and Nicole Patel Vaughn arrive on a similar course dive into action to make the ditch passable and keep the girls on course toward their next checkpoint. In the truck? Yeah, seriously. Hold up your pinky when you drive that thing, you know. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just gonna do that. Yeah, here. Wipe, get the towel wet. Okay. okay. The girls are moving up to the higher rankings, but it's not going to be easy to stay there. stopped right now because as we were driving along we heard a clunking and I realized um, I had broken a shock mount on our truck. It's the right front shock mount. The shock mount right here is snapped up. It's push punching up here. That's not good. Tore right here. 
decided we're gonna try to actually ratchet the spring, the shock out of the way. I'm gonna try to wrap around one of these, the top and a coil. Okay. And it needs to come through here. Okay. And come to this. Thing is beefy. Yeah, it's. <laughs> But what we did was we ratcheted as tight as I could physically do, what we could do, is this. And it didn't bring it down too far, but we got it down just enough to where at least um, it won't continue hitting things. It, it at least keeps it in one place so it's not going to keep wanting to punch through the, the metal. And I'm just going to have to go really, 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 really slow. And I'm going to have to drive around a lot of things. If we can get it back to the Biv tonight, I think the mechanics can weld and fix it, but we are a long ways away from the biv right now, and we're only, I mean, it's the still beginning of the day. It's only 11 o'clock in the morning. If they call for assistance, they'll be disqualified. They'll have to race the rest of the day on the broken shock and their temporary fix. It's going to be a long day. The next morning we found ourselves waking up at the base of a volcano. The apocalyptic landscape offered a stark contrast to our time in the jungle. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. <laughs> mm. And it looks warm out in the sun out there. Is it warm? Yeah, the nod, camera nod. Yeah. Cinematic trick. Yep. You can just use your sandal to dig a hole. Keep going. <laughs> that's Keep not, walking. That's not far enough yet. I'll be dead ready to go when I get there. Give me half an hour. We're gonna go slide down a volcano on makeshift snowboard. So this is exciting. The sledding objective is speed. Lots of it. And Steve has a few reservations. I, I ain't gonna lie, I mean, that, you come off that and uh, <laughs> it's bad news bears. I, I, I think I, I can hit terminal velocity faster than anybody here. Good, I'm in the mood for to watch someone fall down. No, I'm always in that mood. You're in that mood? You like to laugh? I like to laugh. Hey man, people fall. how's it going? Toby. That's me, I'm Joe. Joe? Yeah, this is uh, Joe. If you want to head over, I can do a, a talk about how to do it quickly. Yeah. Uh, you want to put your feet either here, or if you want to go even quicker, lean back as far as possible. Almost lay down and put your feet in the air. Uh, record, uh, I know Bigfoot is uh, 95 kilometers an hour, so you can get up some serious speed. This is actually also where they set the, the world record for uh, cycle speed on gravel. So a guy in 2000 cycled from the top where we poured down and he hit. I think it was 177 kilometers an hour. Oh, okay. 172. What a funny yeah. story, though. In the process, he, he fell off and broke, uh, broke three ribs and dissipated his shoulder. <laughs> and um, ended up in a hospital in Managua, where he fell in love with his nurse and is now married, living in. There's a love story for you. Delivered from Brad Pitt himself. I'm going to be in trouble. I'm not going to lie. A little bit nervous, you know? You know, I got, I got a little thing going against me, it's called gravity. And uh, really concerned about hitting maybe Mach 1, Mach 2, leaving uh, a streak of molten glass as I go down the, the, the slope. Nicaragua? Yeah, yeah. Biggest volcano in Nicaragua there. Brought to you by Fuente Pura. As we make our way to the top, the winds hit hurricane levels making it hard to stand. Ah! We attempt to refresh Steve in his spirits before his dreaded sled ride from hell. Competition is in the air, and Jeff and Toby make wagers to see who will reach the bottom first. I are going to compete here today, um, race of the ages, that's right. And uh, so we have to make sure that our boards are equal. We meet the standard. He hasn't weighted it with lead or... Brad Pitt waves the green, and the two are off.
Toby makes it about three feet and then crashes. Yeah, that wasn't fair! Not fair. He then loses his grip and chases his board the rest of the way. Brad waves on Steve to Lackey, the human torpedo. Steve's sled is pointed one direction, straight towards a hospital bed. <laughs> Whoa! That was a dirty dive! Hold on, here I go! There's no life without intensity. Okay, it's gonna be intense. <laughs> Kyle nearly breaks the sound barrier with imperfect technique destroying a camera lens in the process. <laughs> Scott hits ludicrous speed and takes the cake. <laughs> I think Warren Miller would say that sledding this once is a great experience, but to do it twice would be a dumb experience. Worth the hike. If you get it up, Do you it get every time. On our way out, the rigs conquered the heat of the day, which has made the volcanic rock loose, like marbles under the tire. Traction control and lockers make quick work of it. You know, not many folks can say that they've taken a sled down a volcano and gone off-road over volcanic rock and ash in the same day. We steer the rigs to take on our second volcano, an active volcano known as Talika. We are inbound to meet up with another group of Quetzal trekkers, where we hope to make camp for the night after hiking the mountain. Now we're headed up to Talika, the volcano that we can hike to the ridge of and look down into the caldera pretty tired after hiking the first volcano and sliding down it. It's 100 degrees right now. So I think we're kind of all a little apprehensive of walking furthermore into the, uh, into the heat, but I think it'll be worth it. So we're following our guide here. He's in a nice high top ambulance door Land Cruiser. This road's pretty rough. I've got it in four low. I've got it set to mud, sand, and loose rock. And we got a nice ride through all this. I'm having a blast. Another fun tip, when Kurt says it's in reverse, it's in reverse. That is awesome. Did you mix that up? Huh? <laughs> Did you mix that up? Maybe. I won't admit it. I'm just saying that when you're going up a, a, a steep incline, and there's another vehicle behind you, when Don't. your navigator and co-driver says, hey, by the way, you accidentally have that in reverse, you should probably listen. Everyone put the hand when you say hike volcanoes, you say help kids, okay? Okay. Three, one, two, three, hike volcanoes! Help kids! Woo! Woo! So basically, Quetzal Trekkers is a non-profit uh, tour operator run by volunteers. So we do all this hike um, with tourists. And like all of our guides are volunteers that commit three months and all the profits of the hikes go to projects uh, to pay for teachers, supplies, uh, also like for food for the kids. We've been hiking for five hours. <laughs> it's all the water we have left. I don't know if we're gonna make it. The volcano is daunting and set in a majestic landscape. So over there is San Cristobal. That's the tallest volcano in Nicaragua. 
and the last explosion was 15 days ago. We're eight hours in, water's running even lower, and the sun's going down. Things are getting grim. We'll start praying. Yeah. Here we are at the base of the cauldron of an active volcano. We're gonna eat up here and watch the moon rise. It's a full moon, so we're gonna have a fun night. So behind my finger here is Cerro Negro, which is where we did our volcano boarding this morning. You can see it off in the distance there. It kind of looks like a shadow. It's got the little flat top hiding in the shadow of the mountains there. And now we're on uh, Talica, which is an active volcano or somewhat active. It's off gassing right now. I consider that active. Lava is imminent any minute. So be prepared to run. Well, it's a good thing we're eight hours in. So totally. We, we got yeah, we're a, a long hike, hike in, uh, but I can run pretty fast downhill. <laughs> I'll be, I'll be okay. Not too worried. I'll pay anybody back if there's a fourth one in there. Mas go? Dos mas? Okay. Been on the road a long time. A long time. How often do you get to climb to the top of a volcano and get a Coca-Cola? I don't know, but I'll tell you one thing. It tastes so good when it touches your lips. This is blatant advertising, but we don't freaking care right now. <laughs> Taste happiness. It's pretty cool. It's kind of overwhelming because it's so big. It's 160 down and 160 wide or something. What's the picture? That's steep. That's like 400 feet. And now we're hiking down to a bat cave around the corner. My thoughts so they can reset the smoke bombs down in that crater and throw some flares down there so when we get back, it looks like there's lava. I'm not buying their story. I'm not a believer. I don't believe in volcanoes. But uh, I'm here anyway. We're having a good time. It's a great hike. How many hours are in are we? Uh, we're 10, 12 hours in at least. <laughs> and, uh, 40 clicks. Yeah. 40 clicks out. We are arriving to the bat cave. The species here is the first most deadliest bat in the world. A single bite puts a man flat. What is that? Finding my inner Batman. Several near misses with bites. Just saying. Wow! As darkness falls, we sit in awe, peering into one of the best sunsets of our lives. Top five sunsets of my life. I think surreal is the word I should use. We just sunset, came back to the crater because oh, wow. you can see the lava at night through all the off gas. Oh, yeah, and then just behind you is a full moon. The full moon is coming up tonight. So this is a very special night. I can't, I can't, that, I think that was the best sunset I've ever seen in my life. Two years ago, my grandparents started oh. telling me about these four blood moons that were going to be coming up. And here we are, we just found out that the full moon that's going to be happening is going to be the third blood moon. Every time there's been one blood moon, there's always been something significant. For us to be able to be here watching this full moon on a volcano, it's pretty amazing. So this yeah. is the third one. The next one that's going to come is in the fall. I think they're leaving. <laughs> they're all, they are all leaving. <laughs> are our guides leaving? Leave us. As we head down to camp for the night, the girls are early into their next day and things are not well. Rhonda has come down with some serious symptoms of exertion from the eight days of racing in the Moroccan sun. She's in survival mode, so I'm kind of navigating and driving today, and I'm hoping I don't, I'm hoping we can actually make it home <laughs> with me doing that. So she's pretty sick. Um, we'll take her to the med tent when we get back. 
maybe get an IV in her. Because she needs some electrolytes and fluids, I think. The good news is that their broken shock mount had been repaired by the beginning of this leg. That's a small problem compared to what the girls are facing now. So we hit all of our checkpoints and all of our checkpoints today. Rhonda, at about yesterday afternoon, didn't feel well, started not feeling well. And then all day today, she's been thrown up and not keeping anything down. She drank a lot of water, which is good. But um, we got here and she was worried she wouldn't be able to walk. So I went and grabbed the doctor and he went to help walk her in and she just passed out right on the ground. Montana girls just aren't used to the heat. I serious, it was so hot today. It was hot and it sucks when you're that sick to have to sit in a Jocelyn car all day and she did it all day long and went through dunes. So she needs to just chill out for a while, so yeah. The rally begins at its usual time, but the girls are not on the starting line. Rhonda's condition has become a challenge as French and English translators clash on proper treatment. Like they don't think it's because of the dehydration that she's nauseous. You okay. don't have a gallbladder, so I don't. Yeah, we could. So very well. The gallbladder. Yeah. Gallbladder. French for gallbladder. Uh, <laughs> after you left, no one came here until five minutes before you came back. Again. She almost walked out. I feel better, but I'm still really messed up. Yeah. So there is good. Yep. The race continues on as Rhonda fights to recover. What time is it? 9.45. 9.45, and most people re leave the race line at 6 a.m. And I physically couldn't. I had absolutely no choice, so. Rhonda musters everything she has and takes her seat in the truck. The girls know that if they don't race, they have come all this way for nothing. I am still not 100%, not even close, but we are in 14th place. <laughs> and it is the last day of the rally, and Rochelle and I have decided that our mantra for today is we are more stubborn than the gazelle rally. So we may be really slow, and not the tightest lines because we're choosing roads. But we will get all our checkpoints. <laughs> we'll see. We how, will. However you're feeling. <laughs> Depends on how you're feeling. I feel great. <laughs> They're four hours behind everyone else, and making all the checkpoints today will be next to impossible. It's time to push it and make it happen. Rochelle covers both navigator and driving, as Rhonda supervises the navigation okay, decisions. So we don't have to go around, have to go around. Okay. In order to be gazelles this year, they must complete all checkpoints before sunset to complete the rally. There's a strategy to this race, and it's if you miss one checkpoint, you're penalized like 60 or 90 kilometers. Or more. Or more. So it's actually worse to miss a checkpoint than to take the straightest line before it closes. So when it gets to be like the end of the day and you know you're tired, you just need to get all your checkpoints because you're gonna do better than if you took a straight line and missed one at the end. With time running out and the sun nearly touching the horizon, tension rises as fear of not finding the rally's final flag sets in. Exactly, yeah. on the map where we just Which were. Is just a second behind us. So let's go there and take a heading. So stressful. It's still 71 degrees. Okay, I'll take a heading to there. We'll see where it goes. Okay. think of is it's like maybe just around that bend. Let's go there. I think I see something. There's our flag. Oh my There's gosh. There's our flag. There's our flag. Okay. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. We should have kept going. 
Oh my gosh, we have 14 minutes to get this last flag. <laughs> That was the most stressful 15 minutes of my life, I think. It was pretty stressful. In the dark, the XLs find their way back to the bivouac to an amazed group of fellow American racers. part when you're finished and you know that your family is on the other side of the world still and you still you can't just hop on a plane in one day and go see them it still takes it's a whole journey just to get home it is I'm feeling very proud of what we accomplished and I'm really excited that we hit our goal our goal is to get all of our checkpoints it was more Rhonda's goal I thought I thought it was crazy I was like okay and top 20 and top 20 it's like, yeah, okay, we'll, uh, we'll see how we that goes. I really think we got top 20. I think so, too. <laughs> but no problems are only solutions. That's true. Well, and I think we also both realize that the rally isn't about giving you new tools. It's about helping you unpack the tools you didn't know you already had. Yeah. And I think that's true for every single woman who's ever done the rally. No matter yeah. how good they've placed, it doesn't matter. You still did nine days through the Sahara Desert with mm -hmm. one other woman. You, mm -hmm. you just realize that you had a lot more tools in your tool belt and you were even, there's no reason to know they're there until you're put in a test to figure out how to, that you need to use them. Over the last couple of days, we have made our way south to just outside San George on the shore of Lake Nicaragua. Steve is tackling the hardest meal of the trip so far. So tonight for dinner, what we're doing is doing hot dogs, keeping it, keeping it simple. And your favorite and mine is the creamiest, it's the cheesiest. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, it's Kraft macaroni and cheese. Must have. Waiting for us at camp at a data price of a squillion dollars a megabyte is the NBC News story just released on Scott and I's wives. The NBC Nightly News uh, where our wives, Ron and Rochelle, were uh, featured on the Rally Asia de Gazelles race. So we're seeing footage that we haven't seen yet as well. It's pretty exciting to be on the NBC Nightly News. That's kind of a big deal. Two American moms ventured out for a spring break like no other. In the dunes of Morocco last week, Rhonda Cahill and Rochelle Croft are plotting their next, well, expedition. The two working moms are embarking on a unique adventure, putting their friendship to the test as they trade the mountains of Montana for this. Morocco's Sahara Desert. I'm so glad we pushed through it because it feels so good on the other side to know that you conquered something that was really, really hard. <laughs> You're gonna cry. <laughs> she's, she's starting not to cry. <laughs> A journey like no other on the face of the globe that is empowering women one dune at a time. Oh, that's pretty, pretty cool. Well, and in case you were wondering, the Montana moms finished 14th out of 125 teams. Watching that and then being here at the same time. Yeah knowing how well they did and everything that they overcame over there with all the breakdowns that they had and being sick and everything like that. Got some pretty cool chicks. It's awesome. I'm a proud husband, that's for sure.
It's really cool. Tomorrow, we will cross into the beautiful and much anticipated country of Costa Rica. Costa Rica is about to push our team and the rigs to the very limit between adventure and disaster. <laughs>